Welcome back class. This is um, part two of the video. We now go from creation, go back maybe um, whatever, however long it took you. We go forward now to the flood. Now generations of people have been living on the earth for a long time. Up to 900 years they're having lots of kids and the population is growing pretty quick. I'm not going to get into that very much. But flood, okay, this is the next most important story that we have in in Genesis, and this is the story of um, God. Um, just, I guess I want to say it in a, in a good way, but God showing that He does have His sense of justice, but He also has love in it all. So, man's corruption and sin eventually was um, it reached its threshold with God, and so God couldn't tolerate it anymore. And so the story goes that He He gives a man named Noah the blueprints to build an ark. And so up to this point, there was no history of rain or anything like that. So he starts building this big boat, huge boat, ginormous. And on it, he's going to keep two of every kind of animals. And as he's building this ark, there's people who are scorning him saying, well, what are you doing? He's a crazy man building an ark. And Noah stays faithful. He's one of the few people on earth, who, or the only one, God says, is, is righteous and worthy of or I guess not really worthy, but God has mercy on him and says, this person is the one who will, I will use to bring people through the water and start through, start again. And so he builds this ark. Okay, God's wrath is poured out upon the world and he floods the whole earth, um, shoots up springs of water and it rains like crazy. Um, there's lots of theories on what that could have been. Um, there are lots. There's a, quite a bit of evidence for a, a worldwide flood if you are someone who um, thinks there isn't. So um, it's it's very interesting to look into it. And it says rain for 40 days. Those 40 days of rain, Noah's in the ark with all the animals. The water goes up. And then after it stops raining, it takes another 40 days or more for the water to go down. And he sends a bird out and it eventually you know, it doesn't come back. And, and so then... No one knows, oh, it's time to open up the gates, let the animals out. And so at the end of it all, God has put Noah and his family, his three sons, their wives, and these are the people who God makes a new covenant with. And he says, never again will I destroy the whole earth with a flood again. And he gives the promise symbol of a rainbow and says, this is how you will know my promise. And so we... Um, learn that. And from this story, there's a lot of themes that um, begin throughout uh, the rest of the scriptures. Is God's cleansing with water and God's cleansing of the earth, God's cleansing of us through the sacrifice of animals, through other things like that. But it also shows how God is preserving creation. He's preserving his work. He's preserving a remnant, those he longs to to keep as a part of his family and he won't let go of. And so you also see through this, this is God is one of the first times he makes a promise, okay? Making a promise to the world. And we call those covenants. And he seals it. And he's the one who keeps it, not us. There's no part of this Noah story where it's all up to Noah to keep it. <laughs> it's really like, um, and so through this, we see that he, he makes promises to the world. And that he has a plan to save it. Still, he will continue to work his plan of redemption in bringing this world back to himself. The next story, and um, this one is a little more popular. You can go to um, history. You can learn all about Babylon and Nimrod, all these things. There's lots of theories out there. There's lots of stories, not just from the Hebrew culture, but um, throughout ancient times of a tower in Babylon that was created and built. And so there's a lot of collabor corroborating evidence for this. Um, but um, our next story is the Tower of Babel. And some people might wonder why include this story as just another story, another event. Um, but I think it plays a very integral role in God's um, greater plan and how we get to Revelation and in the throne room where God is being worshipped by every tongue and tribe and language from around it, uh, from all time in this world, and how um, how really now 
how do we get to this point of lots of languages? So the Tower of Babel takes place in Genesis 11. Go ahead and read that right now. Pause the video. And it is about um, the people. After Noah's time, they have forgotten about what God had done. And they all have the same language, same tongue. And they're, a lot of them are still living in this area. And so they do not want to be obedient to the Lord. They want to be like God. And so they said, we're going to build a tower to the heavens right up to where God is, and it'll be our statement, it'll be our kingdom, it'll be our glory. And so, um, the people okay, were not listening to God's commands to fill the earth. They're all hanging out together. Remember, he gave that command, go and be fruitful. He also told Noah that, go and fill the earth. Go to the ends of it. Extend my glory. Take my image everywhere. And so, um, they're being disobedient in wanting to be like God. They're also being disobedient in not fulfilling that command to going. They're all hanging out together. And so God in his, I think in his love, he comes down and says, says this isn't good. So he, he through working a miracle, changes everyone's language on them. They wake up, they just can't understand anymore. And so it's hard to work with someone who you don't understand. Right. And so if, because of these languages in him changing everyone's language to different ones, the brand new, obviously, um, everyone disperses. The tower is left undone and people go throughout the world, finding a place to settle where they speak their own language. OK, so a few themes and lessons we're learning about that is. The first one is, and it continues to be a theme, is man trying to be like God. Us trying to be God. Us in rebellion against who God is and his desire for us to be in communion, to be in relationship, to, to allow him to be Lord and for us just to, to have this dwelling and this, and this dependence upon him that's wonderful. The other thing is people were unified through language. Okay, the language was something that unified them. God dispersed them, and in God's dispersing of them, okay, they go everywhere. They're spread out through the ends of the earth. And actually, this is um, God almost forcibly doing or getting it, the people of the earth at that time to follow his command of going to the ends of the world and being fruitful and increasing in number, extending his glory. Okay, but. Even here, it's incredible to think that God, as he sends them out, he also already has a plan to bring them back in. So through this, we see God's desire to, to receive glory, how he is jealous, okay? And he wants our hearts. He, he wants us to be right with him. He wants us to be um, with him in paradise and to, to experience his his love and his mercy. And it's never about what we have done for God. It's never about the right words that we've said. It's never about any sacrifices or gifts that we've given him. We just see throughout history, it's all about God choosing us, God wanting and desiring us, and us putting our hope and our trust and our faith in him. And that is what saves us, not sacrifice, not works. Okay, um, the last point for this one, um, is that God is using, this is the beginning of a story, or not necessarily, it's the, another piece to the puzzle of how God is showing how necessary it is for mankind to be saved. That we cannot do it on our own. We can't live right before God. And so our sin is just always getting flashed in front of us. Through the story, we're seeing how bad people really are. And how badly we don't want God and what he wants for us. And how badly God wants us and is willing to make a way for us. So we see that I'm saying extending God's glory. When I say that, it's it's a theme in the Bible that God is um, wanting all of the world to know about him. And he chooses different vessels to do that. And so it starts small and it grows bigger and bigger and bigger. And that will actually be the next part of our video series is going to be God's next step. And that next step is God taking action and establishing a bloodline. He finds the lowest of the low. His name is Abraham. And he says, with you, I'm going to make a covenant. You're not going to be able to keep it, but it's on me to keep it. Thank you, guys. I hope you enjoy. Have a wonderful day.